second chance. No, but I did. I don't know. Something. I remind. I remind. Put him in my bag. Like, I even think I'm like, so that's why I'm like, I don't know what it is. But Sam, you know, I wrote 70 years later, no solutions. Okay, Jesse, what's your plan? Okay, what are the forces for this in the different systems and Yeah, that's what I'm asking. No. Yeah. How to sustainability in oh, the Christina. That's the system. Yeah, something more specific. Oh, wait, hold that, hold, hold that thought. Um, how can transit compete? Right? When it's totally dysfunctional. You got one? Okay. okay. I forgot your first name. Here you go. Got it? I'm here. No. No. So place and the future development. That's future. Yeah. How can an understanding in place be the basis of the future? Is that good? Yeah. Okay, Ryan, you got one? We want we want you to be in the game here. Okay. Um, George Austin, I helped him. I gave him five minutes. If he doesn't come up to good one, you're in big trouble. Uh, okay, Ryan. Yes. Don't worry, it's not your fault. It's Austin's fault. <laughs> what do you got? Uh, okay, there we go. Why? <laughs> <laughs> How can we push things Okay. That's a system. How can we incentivize better behaviors? Wow. Good job, Austin. But we know it's really Ryan's question. How can we incentivize better behaviors? Okay. Anyone who didn't, who's not up here, wants to be? Anyone who's not up here and doesn't want to be? Just raise your hand. Okay. You can talk to that. Okay. So, I'm not sure, maybe you can advise me. I'm not sure if this topic should become before or after last week's topic. Because there's something about this topic that all of a sudden we all have opinions about the automobile. Like how many of you, raise your hand if you went to high school. Oh. Almost everyone raised their hand. This is great. I'm thrilled. Thank you. 
everyone. Um, did you drive? How many people drove in high school? How many people didn't drive in high school? Overseas, overseas, overseas. No, where? Where were you? Oh, okay. Wow, this surprises me because I used to teach this class. I was asked, I was asked once, um, uh, we want you to teach a class that will help architects understand how interconnected architecture is with everything. You can teach anything you want. And so I said, oh, I know what I'm gonna teach. I'm gonna teach automobility. That's the name of the class. And so this, today's, this week's topic was the focus of an entire course. An entire four credit course was all about this week's topic. And the reason we like it is not because we love cars so much or we think cars, you know, that this is, no. It's so near and dear to your hearts. Like this is a topic that you get. Who's an expert on cars? Who has an opinion about cars as if you're an expert? Who's American? Like this is, there's something so, who, who, who's been ever stuck in a traffic jam? And you know what the solution is, right? Just, just, right? If people stop lane cutting, I think. Okay, right. what are the solutions? When you're in the traffic jam, you came up with the solution. What solution did you come up with? Stop lane cutting. What else? More lanes. More <laughs> lanes. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a job. More lanes, right? Other solutions. Use the okay, now. just hold off. We're we're trying to <laughs> encourage people to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. Don't use it. the Use the Use the what? Use the breakdown lane. Use the breakdown lane, which you do. Not unless it says on the sign that it's permitted. Okay. I'm not getting pulled over. Okay, because Ryan's question is right up there. Okay. People who license plate turns in an odd number can try it one day once they try it. Okay. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing I've heard. <laughs> I like Mike's idea. More lanes, right? Who's with me? More lanes. Duh, more lanes. What are the other solutions? What else? More parking? Carpool. Carpool. <laughs> Improve public transportation. What? Okay. No speed limit. No speed limit. Yeah. Who's with me? No speed limit. Yeah. Awesome. The guys, the bros. No, right? Woo. <laughs> There's no speed limit. <laughs> 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 Okay, so this is kind of urgent, and you all have opinions about it, right? This is an opportunity, this topic, remember the thing we always talked about, project, system, culture, right, Narmina? Remember that said project, system, culture, when, I don't know, sounds crazy, right? A single architectural project, the idea here is that a single architectural project, if it's attractive, has the power to shift our thinking about a system. And if it's a profound enough change in the system, it can actually result in change to our culture. <clears throat> Sounds insane, 
right? If you're an architect, that's not how it works. We all know that that's not how it works. But here's an example. That's exactly how it works. That is exactly what happened. Henry Ford and a few other people designed a car. It was a thing, it was a product. It wasn't even architecture. It was smaller than architecture. It was something that would come out of industrial design these days or mechanical engineering. It's just a product. And yet that product became so attractive and it expanded into so many different systems. And those systems were driven by economic incentives of profit motive. It transformed the United States physically and it transformed the neural connections in each of your minds. Our brains are wired the way they are wired because of a product. We know who the winners and losers are in the world. We sort the winners and losers according to the car they drive uh, and a lot of other things. But it used to be uh, as, as recently as the 80s when there were no cell phones. We sorted the winners and losers by not the clothes they wore, but by the cars they drove. Does this ring a bell? Remember in high school? Who were the winners and who were the losers, Mark? When you were a freshman? Uh, people with cars. People, the seniors who were driving to high school were the winners, right? And maybe you guys, who, who was a winner? I guess you were all winners, except for the four who didn't drive. Oh, my parents drove me. Your parents drove you? Winner? You took the bus? I Loser? Won. Loser? <laughs> but you know who the biggest loser I, I'm comfortable labeling loser I'm proud to be the biggest loser in the room because I am such a loser I have never owned a car that's how big of a loser I am I have always lived within bicycle riding distance of where I work. And that is not easy. I lived in, I grew up in suburban Connecticut and I was one of the losers who took the bus. Hey, that topic of being able to like decode the orchestra, that was something. It was, wasn't it? Coincidence? I think not. I think not. <laughs> Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe not. So let's get into this because you notice how we're always running out of time in the lecture. There's always a feeling like I never really get into it. Let's get into it. It's warm in here still. Who's our climate control uh, system? Okay. Automobility. Get our systems operating. So that was the preamble. I should know the shortcut for doing this because I do it five or six times. What does this symbol mean? Like, how do I, what is that? That command? No, that's just the key. Is this, is this key is control. It's awesome. That's control on a Mac? Yeah. Control, shift, command, H. It's control, option, command, H. Control, option, command, H. Thank you, tech support. Oh, control, option, command, H. Okay. So here are our topics. I hope we can do justice to this topic. Let's first start with history. Uh, everyone knows that Los Angeles is a car dominant place, right? Until recently, everyone knows that. Was it ever not a car dominated place? So yes. When? Before automobiles were invented. Thank you. Before the Spaniards and then the gold rush, before all of that, there was, it was populated. It was crowded with people. Those people 
got killed or swept away, 95%. Then the Spanish colonial forces came. Uh, then uh, gold, fast forward to gold. But uh, let's say around 1900, uh, how did people get around? They walked. And let's say, let's fast forward 1920, there are cars. How did people get around LA? By car. Mm -hmm. Not everyone had the bar. They were, they were just losers. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just my <laughs> natural reaction. That's un American. I'm sorry. Go on. Um, people like so street cars as well. I walk in because our planet has mass produced. Street cars? They had street cars? Street. Oh. They had the most street cars of any city in the world, Los Angeles, California, was the mass transportation capital of the universe. What is a streetcar suburb? We know this term streetcar suburb because our friend Sam Bass Warner, mm -hmm. a neighbor who lives in, around here, wrote a book called Streetcar Suburb. He looked at this neighborhood and he said, yes, this neighborhood was a streetcar suburb, the Green Line. Uh, how does the streetcar suburb work? Here's how it works. Step one, purchase farmland. Well, first, what does the streetcar suburb look like? It has housing on these side streets that uh, are typically 200 feet uh, space, all these si long side streets that might be 400, 600, 800 feet long, and lots of row houses or single family houses, that works too. And there's a main street where the shopping occurs and that's where the streetcar line runs. That's the pattern. And you can make the housing uh, blocks as far away from this as you want, right? No, it's limited. How far is it okay? How far is too far? How far is just right? This is great. I have a short walk to get on the streetcar and go to work. This is fine. How far away can I go before it's too far? We mentioned it before. It's about a quarter mile, five minutes. 10 minutes is okay too. That's about a half mile, 10 minutes. But you know what I found out? My son lives um, in Worcester, he goes to WPI because Wentworth doesn't have a good robotics program. And uh, his roommates have cars and they drive to campus. And so he just was conditioned by the social uh, environment of his apartment to just know that campus is a drive away. Uh, at graduation, he slept through it. So I, I, me and my sister, um, do a Google map thing to his house and say, oh, we might have to Uber there. And, and so we look it up and said, oh no, it's a half mile. He said, oh, I must have gotten the address wrong. I checked the address. No, it's a half mile. We walked there. By the time we got there, he had left, but we didn't see him go by. You know why? I found out later, he took an Uber because it's a half mile. And so I got him on the phone, he was up at campus. And so I said, okay, We'll, we'll come up to campus. So we went up to campus and we looked all over for him. He wasn't there, but we didn't pass him. You know why? He took an Uber. So it's a half mile, it's 10 minutes between campus and his apartment. And I don't think he's ever walked it. He's lived there for a year. So this is how strong the social forces are to tell you that winners don't walk. My own son. Um, so how far? Half mile, max. Um, and here's, here's how we did it. Uh, it turned, you know, this is where the port is. This is where the factories, this is where the businesses are. This is where the offices are. And then if you wanna work, uh, if you wanna have a job, if you, unless you're a farmer, you can live within a quarter mile, half mile, maybe even a mile of that center and you walk to work. 
that's how it was until around 1900. And then, well, the late, late uh, 1800s, they started these things called streetcars. At first they were pulled by horses and then later they were made electric. And uh, if you wanted to uh, develop real estate, you purchase uh, farmland for a dollar an acre. And then you, you finance and build a streetcar line down the center of that farmland. And now, so that's the first thing you do. It's very expensive. How expensive is it to build a streetcar line? Very expensive. How do they justify it? Without a streetcar line, this land is worth a dollar an acre. With a streetcar line, this land is worth $10 an acre. How much does a streetcar cost? Well, if you have enough acres, it might add up to be like $4 an acre. So you spend a dollar an acre, then you spend $4 an acre to build the streetcar line, and then you sell it for $10 an acre. Pretty good living. So this guy did that one. Then his brother-in-law said, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to do that too. His brother-in-law does that one, et cetera. And before you know it, you've got the Twin Cities area of St. Paul and Minneapolis. And then you do that in, you do that in Los Angeles and pretty soon you have the most extensive transit system in the world. And it, this is what it looks like downtown, same pattern that we saw blown up in St. Paul and Minneapolis. And then regionally, this is what it looks like all the way from Long Beach to Burbank, et cetera, way out to Pasadena. So that was the, the tram system of Los Angeles. What happened to the tram system of Los Angeles? Have you ever seen this movie? It's a cartoon, right? So you can't take it seriously. And this is the scene where the evil villain played by a weasel or a, <laughs> I don't know. But the weasel is, is uh, confessing. This is the point where the heroes are trapped and they're going to be murdered, right? Because they know too much. And because they're going to be killed, the villains reveal the whole plan. What was the plan? The plan was to purchase the streetcar lines of Los Angeles and destroy them and force people to buy cars. That's ridiculous. The other one except for the one in 10. You know where this is going, right? Okay, where's Nick? State electric motors made the right. How did I do this? Who remembers? Sound. Rodrigo's MacBook Pro. The one in ten automobile uh, used rail. Right. Uh, 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 uh. At that time, I was flown. Said, "Wait a minute! This is a great opportunity. We've, we've got ninety percent of the market out there that we can somehow turn into automobile users. We can eliminate the rail alternatives. We will create a new market for ourselves." If we don't, then this whole, you know, the entire General Motors sales are just be, are going to be level. They had to get rid of the streetcars. They wanted the space that the streetcars used for automobiles.
They had to find something they could put in place for three parts. Sloan found a concept that he wanted to somehow motorize all the major cities of the country and then to uh, replacing all the street rail with these two buses. And ultimately, thinking that no one would want to ride the bus and therefore going to buy General Motors automobile. Sloan wanted to get a very big in this field. What he bought was phenomenal the largest bus operating company in the country and the largest bus production company. And using that as a foothold, GM moved into Manhattan. They acquired interest in the New York Railway. And between 1926 and 36, they methodically destroyed the rails. When they were finally motorized, General Motors issued these, these ads throughout the country. It's important that they're trying to show that motorization is the wave of the future. They issued these ads and said, the motorization of Fort and Madison is the most important and ethical event in the history of community transportation. In the mid 1930s, GM worked hard to create the impression of a nationwide trend away from rail. Culture, cultural shift. First, change the culture, then, change the system. Buses were a tough sell. They jolted, they smelled, they inched through traffic. City by city, it took a hidden hand of General Motors to replace street coach with yellow coach buses. In 1936, a company was founded that would grow to dominate American city transportation. National City Lines had no visible connection to General Motors. In fact, the director of operations came from the GM subsidiary, Yellow Coach, and members of the board came from Greyhound, which was founded and controlled by General Motors. The money to start this new company also came from Greyhound and Yellow Coach. To hide these connections, the company needed a front man. Roy Fitzgerald, that is start in northern Minnesota, where he hauled miners and school children in a couple of buses. General Motors would groom him to become president of National City. Yes. Over the next few years, Standard Oil of California, Mack Truck, Phillips Petroleum, and Firestone Tire would join GM in backing this venture. All of a sudden, you get these stars with the, the door at match, which back and nothing can get up. The pink gold shoes, the broad ties, the black shirts, the white hand ones. All of a sudden, they show up. And of course, the word goes out, hey, we're being born. Fitzgerald, big name in buses. National City now in top place as operator of City Route Miles. <laughs> Prime mover is E. Roy Fitzgerald. He describes himself as one of five farm boys trying to run a few buses. The Fitzgeralds came in here just like they did in every city they ever went into. They destroyed and established. Public transportation. 83 cities. To meet the needs of the people. Well, we love right And it was fun because there were big, you know, the plenty of room and all that. We catch up with the stage every day. You know, and the and you meet people that you see every day. And you learn a phrase to, to talk to someone. The pickup was fat. It is. He just jumped in the chairs that there, it was so fast. And then I come out there every time he would come to front, he'd go, clink, 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 clink. Oh, yeah, Jake, what are you doing? Yeah. 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 We have somebody who has a bright idea to take all the tracks and get rid of all the trucks. That's when the headache starts. How long did it take to show up for a good Uh, About 90 days. 
No, I'm, I'm not being facetious about that. Weren't those big cars making money in Los Angeles? Well, after I got done chopping their heads off, we made money. Cut the miles down. Sell off the properties. Pull the company down. They don't take the service out. They just cut it back. They'll take it and they'll cut it from 10 minutes to 12 minutes, from 12 to 15, from 15 to 20, from 20 to 20 minutes. So they reduce the service. And every time you reduce the service, you make it less attractive. No less attractive, no less writers. And then they say, well, see, we can't make any money. So they abandoned it. People told me you went in there and fired everyone off when you got like there. That's right. Why did you do that? Well, if you don't need the people, what are you going to do? Keep them around the place? Those people on there was up for retirement. And you always get rid of your own who's first. And that's what we do. So they, uh, National City Lines purchased the streetcar systems from 83 cities. Then they, uh, they reduced the service uh, and then they ended the service, replacing it with buses. And then just to make sure it would never come back, they spent a huge amount of money pulling the rails out of the asphalt and the cobblestones. So they invested a huge amount of money to make sure that the rail streetcar systems would never be put back. And then they burned the cars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see what They did in Baltimore, they did in Philadelphia. They did it in Los Angeles. Come in and do a job. <clears throat> and five gallons of kerosene went with every trolley, put a torch to it, and that's the way it went. Now, you stripped everything. They don't have to say. One space out, you can box it. It'll perpetuate itself. So the buses are caught in traffic. The suburbs wouldn't exist if it were for cheap oil. Um, the U.S. is a car culture. The automobile industry started in the U.S. And really, the automobile industry got got to start here because we were looking for ways to use that cheap oil. The U.S. was awash in oil in the early 20th century. In the 1930s, they were discovering the stuff so fast that um, oil in Texas was cheaper than drinking water by the car load. The car companies quickly became the engine driving U.S. industry and economic growth. The result of this is that uh, we have created this new system of habitation where people live miles and miles from where they work and from where they get their food and all of, all of their other necessities based on the idea that they can and they must hop in their car at any moment and, and travel miles and miles. And the only way that works is on the basis of cheap energy. Now we're stuck up a cul-de-sac in a cement SUV uh, with an empty gas tank. Okay, you get the idea. Any questions about this? I'm not saying this is what we should do in terms of project system culture, but uh, if you have any doubt that it's in, about what architecture could do, just look at what the car did. It changed everything. And when we look back, like, you know what we used to call Gothic architecture? We used to call it modern. You know what we used to call Renaissance architecture? Modern. So what someday 20, 21st century modernism is gonna look so different from 20th century modern architecture. We're gonna have to figure out what makes it so different from what we do now in the 21st or the 22nd century? And some of us have already identified it. 
20th century modernism is on its way to being labeled petro architecture or carbon architecture or something based on the very low cost of fossil fuels. So something that relates that that's what's gonna make 20th century modernism different. And yet we teach architecture as if it's all about Corbusier. Corbusier is a big part of it. Mies van der Rohe is important, but this stuff is invisible to us because it's in the water we drink, it's in the air we breathe, it's in the neural structures that are imprinted uh, as soon as we open our eyes as, as newborn babies, right? If you were a Martian, if you were an alien and you came down, maybe you are, I'm not saying, you know, okay, <laughs> nothing against aliens, but if you're an alien and you come down to earth and you open your eyes and you've never seen anything like this before, how long does it take you and uh, using your anthropology skills to figure out what the system is and what are the values that drive the system. Just look at the built environment and that is where you see the evidence of all of these things. Race, gender, automobility, uh, capitalism, it's all imprinted in the built environment. And no one, you don't have to read anything, you don't have to talk to anybody. Just look at the way the world operates and how do we sort winners and losers that's how you understand what the culture is and what the system that supports those cultural values are. How does it reproduce itself? And the place where the reproduction of this system starts is in the neural pathways of every human that is born and raised within this built environment. Uh, this is uh, the whole topic of structure and agency. It's it's very abstract and very esoteric, but if you ever watched any Star Trek anything, that's all Star Trek is about from start to finish. It's about structure and agency. You know, Kirk and Picard and all of these people, Pike, they all find themselves in these structured situations and they, find, they identify the opportunity for agency to shift the whole thing. Um, and that's what I, when you're, next time you're watching a movie, I, don't, I know you don't have time to watch movies, you have this education to take care of. But someday, if you ever watch a movie, you know, once your student loans are paid off, you'll watch a movie someday, I hope. Um, look for this thematic structure, structure and agency. And uh, that, is a way of understanding in a much deeper way what architecture can do. We used to, I've told you this before that in the 20th century and when I was going to school, we were taught that architecture was separate from the world. It was this white box of museums and wealthy people's homes and that's where architects uh, spent their mental and physical energies. It was in that white box separated from this, all of this, separated from uh, the global south, separated from uh, strip malls. When's the last time someone designed a strip mall and studio? Pretty rare, right? But that is the world we live in and it operates the way it operates because the architecture. And how does this system reproduce itself every generation? What was that question? Um, 70 years later, still no solutions. That, that's an abbreviation of someone's question. Like we know what the problem is and really we're still reproducing this over and over again. Not only are we reproducing it over and over again, it's exploding because now we're doing it in China, we're doing it in India, we're doing it in Indonesia, which are three of the four largest countries in the world. And, uh, so it, it's, it's not getting better, it's getting just getting bigger. So architecture is one of the vehicles for producing this system and architecture, more importantly, architecture is the mechanism by which these systems reproduce themselves. 
we are born into this world, especially if you're raised in the suburbs. We internalize it. It alters our neural pathways. We get uh, yelled at from by the seniors who are driving down the road and they say, loser freshman, get a car, right? This gets imprinted and it, it takes on a life of its own. And uh, even though we're well-educated and, um, or especially because we're well-educated, we then go out and we reproduce these systems for the next generations. Um, in future weeks, as we dig deeper, we're gonna look at uh, architecture's uh, profound role in these visions, which are still part of the architectural education. We still have people saying, oh, look, the cars are so small and cute, right? They're totally out of scale, it's a lie. The cars are dangerous, so let's, let's give the people an elevated place. Let's separate the cars. Look, it's the high line, right? But this is a big part of the problem. And I'm not gonna dwell on it now because we have uh, a whole semester left. Uh, and we looked at this, I believe, Futurama, did you have Futurama in History 32? Remember that? Let's look at it, let's just do the brief version. How does, how does this culture and system uh, take on a life of its own? How does it go from a car to being a system to being a culture? Here's a brilliant example of how that, that works. The 1939 World's Fair uh, posed the question, what will the future look like? What will it be? And they answered the question with, uh, this was one of the most successful, most visited exhibitions at one of the most successful, most visited World's Fairs in history, the 1939 World's Fair in Queens, New York. And this was designed by Norman Bel uh, funded by General Motors. It was called Futurama, uh, hours long, wait in line, and then you get on a conveyor belt and you move around an architectural model, an enormous architectural model with cars that move. And this looks normal, right? This model doesn't look that weird. Well, it looked weird at the time. One of the reasons this doesn't look weird to us is Norman Bel Geddes and General Motors envisioned the world of 1960, which was 21 years into the future. They envisioned it, and after World War II, that vision, those neural pathways that got embedded in people's minds in 1939, they, they had a chance to reproduce the world that was envisioned. And so we built it. So this is a model, an architectural model shown to a lot of people who after World War II built it. They made sure this is the way the world went. American cities have fundamentally altered how they built themselves over the last 16 years. And to me, the, the place that it really started was the 1939 World Fair. And what was the most successful World Fair in history, the most successful exhibit. He's just repeating what I said. You get a glimpse into the future of this unfinished world of ours <clears throat> that has been created for the New York World Fair. They do have them in China. Of the developments ahead of us. A vivid tribute to the There's the model. And then they built it full scale. What will we see? Futurama portrayed the future of the city in that distant year, 1960. The world we are now seeing is a vision, an artistic conception, which may undergo many changes as it develops into the great realities of tomorrow. And it portrayed a city that was car driven, lots of open spaces. You could live in the country. That's a model. And drive to your job downtown, and you'd have the best of two worlds. 
Over space, man has begun to win victory. Suburban splendor and urban excitement. If you're white. Uh, not coincidentally, Futurama was sponsored by General Motors. And they were promoting what we wanted. And it's really since that 1939, just before the war, the clouds looming over Europe. We go off to war and we have this image that's knowing in our minds. And we come back and we implement Futurama. 15 million GI came back from the war, clamoring for new homes and a piece of land in the country. Almost yeah. overnight. Cost five thousand dollars to build these houses. Now they're worth a million dollars. My father was part of that because he was built. So in our area in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, his employer, the Chase Angels Company, was finishing a home a day for years following the second. And this was all about a new hopeful American dream. No street cars. Questions? Okay, next. Um, there was uh, the US government uh, operated the way it operated, uh, which was very different than today. It wasn't until after World War II that the automobile industry invented this thing called lobbying. The automobile industry was the first industry to establish a trade association and they actually spent money to pay professionals to take Congress people out to lunch and talk to them about legislation and legislative programs. And the automobile industry invented the US government, the, the system that we have now. They invented it. Uh, and it's not surprising that uh, the U.S. government uh, listened when someone bought them lunch. And they listened so well that uh, President Eisenhower, after World War II, with the, uh, during the Cold War, we we're afraid of nuclear uh, war with the Soviet Union. We need to disperse our population, if you're white, and move them out into the suburbs on subsidized uh, freeway systems uh, and subsidized mortgage lending, if you're white. And then the, uh, then the Defense Highway Act was not part of that. It was part of the defense system. The US government funded the construction of interstate highways that connected every corner of the 48 states of the United States uh, with every other corner. The big question was, what do you do when you get to cities? How do the highways connect to cities? Do you stop and you come into the cities on local roads? Do you make ring roads uh, around the city? Or I don't know, do you plow the freeway right through town? If you plow it through the town, where do you put it? How do you plow it through the town? Caleb. Of course you do. It makes anything else would make no economic sense. It's all about economics. The least valuable land is already mapped out by the federal loan program that we talked about last week. Uh, the red zones, the, the hazardous neighborhoods. What makes a neighborhood hazardous? 
if it has noxious industry or it has non-white residents. That's what makes it a noxious, a hazardous zone. It's just common sense. That is the system. It's embedded in the system. And if you think that these people were mean, I don't know about that. There's a lot of question about why can't people behave better? One of my best friends in high school uh, had a wonderful father. He was a coach for the soccer team. He was soft-spoken. He was gentle. He was kind. He was always generous. Uh, but he was also the CEO of a mining conglomerate that mined copper in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Wisconsin. And then he expanded his mining operations overseas. He was a lovely man. But the wealth that he generated was generated uh, with a lot of people getting harmed and dying. So Robert Moses solved this question. So the culture, this, this, is, this is America. If you're an American, it's your God-given right to purchase an automobile, uh, carry a boat on the back and see the country. And we built roads. I love these roads through the national parks, Logan Pass and Glacier National Parks, my favorite. I love it. But what do you do when you get to the cities? Robert Moses answered the question. He's the most powerful uh, public figure never elected to office. And he said exactly as you heard what Caleb and Megan were saying, you identify the red line neighborhoods and uh, that's where you put the road. Um, if you have a good neighborhood, this is not the best picture. That's not, let's go back. Well, we'll see it. We'll see it in a few slides. So this is Houston. And um, exactly what some of you said when you were stuck in traffic, that was the policy. That was the engineering approach that was taught at MIT and uh, all of the universities. You could take a course called transportation planning. And that was a euphemism for automobile planning. Basically, what you learned in transportation planning school was forget about everything else. It's all about the car. And here's what you do. You predict what the needs are going to be in the future. You build a road based on that prediction, and you provide the automobile infrastructure based on your future projections. It's called predict and provide. Predict and provide. There it is. And... Uh, and then when that infrastructure is overwhelmed, you build more. If, if the traffic is slow, you add a lane, right? Who's with me? Add a lane, just add a lane. If there's not enough parking, add more parking, right? So this is what it looks like when you follow that logic of predict and provide. This is downtown Houston, where 15% of the area is for buildings, and 85% of the land area is for parking and, uh, and streets and highways. Guess what city at the time of this photo had the worst traffic of any city in the United States? This city. So what's the solution? Maybe it should be 90%. Infrastructure, ten percent buildings. What do you think would happen if we did that? And maybe it should be five percent and ninety-five percent. Eventually, you get to the point where we were talking early before class with Jan about what the situation in Bangkok was in the eighties, where you get in your car in the morning and you you have to have a chauffeur. If you're of a certain class in Bangkok, you have a chauffeur, you sit in the back. Back then we had fax machines. Uh, we didn't have computers yet, but we had fax machines and typewriters and we didn't have cell phones. But 
we had modems. I don't know how we did it, but we would get in the back of the car in Bangkok and head off to our one o'clock meeting. So we'd get in the car at eight o'clock in the morning and we sit in traffic and we sit in traffic some more and we do our work and read our things and get faxes and send faxes. And around 1130, you haven't moved very far. So it's clear that you're not going to make it. So you, you have to get a message to your one o'clock appointment that you're not going to make it. So you turn around and go back home. It takes you the rest of the day. And you try again the next day. And that's how life in Bangkok was in the 80s. Maybe the 90s. I don't know. So here's, um, here's an example that is not back in the day. This is right now. This is uh, a New York Times article that, um, let's see if we can look at it this way. The New York Times interactive uh, features uh, is pretty, pretty good. How are they getting through? This is like totally blocked and I don't know what's going on here. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, so there it is. This is the neighborhood we were just looking at of Houston. And so what do you do? Because they have horrible traffic and not enough parking. So what do you do? Here's what they do. So this highway was first built in the 1960s. It divided neighborhoods. It destroyed uh, neighborhoods uh, of non-white residents and displaced them. Um, and here's what we're doing now. And this is, I'm sorry, but this is not a happy story. Look at this point of view. This is exactly what we do in this class, right? They're catching on to it too. I don't think the person doing this took this class but you would think they did. Um, instead of pursuing ways to connect the city better, the Texas Department of Transportation has proposed a $9.7 billion plan. That's almost as much as the big dig to widen the highways with additional lanes. And guess where they're gonna do it? It would forcibly locate over a thousand families and has already emptied the Clayton Homes, a public housing development built in 1952 which served mostly black residents before they were evicted. It underlines the problem facing cities across America. This is the race. This is just like the maps we look at in this class. Uh, look for the neighborhoods with uh, high uh, minority residents. And that's where you can now apparently still build freeways. And now here's the other one. Look at this graphic. I wish we could do this. Here's the George Washington Bridge. Um, and here's uh, the Bruckner Cross Bronx Expressway. And this is how Robert Moses, this is in 1954, Robert Moses was trying to figure out what to do. And this is what they figured out. You remove these residents and, and cut a freeway across the Bronx. The interchanges take up a lot of space. Isn't this brilliant, this graphics? Go New York Times. 40,000 residents. Uh, it kind of ruined the Bronx. Uh, it depressed the property values because it's no fun to have a freeway running past your house. Uh, a lot of people relocated to Co-op City, which is something you could analyze uh, in coming weeks when we're looking at Radiant Garden City models. And so here we go, all the way across. And so this is uh, an example of what Robert Moses and the highway plans around the New York metropolitan area did. And it is pretty much exactly what was envisioned in the Futurama exhibition of the 1939 World's Fair.
And um, there's a lot of good stuff in here. One of the things they show is this is, um, they do a time lapse. This is a very attractive neighborhood. This is the kind of neighborhood. <clears throat> if, if we ever get to the end of this lecture, we're gonna look at the models for what your practice space is going to look like. The people you work with and for are going to have you designing and building things that look a lot like this. It's not just the future, it's also the past. 1935, <clears throat> prosperous black neighborhoods in Chicago's South Side, black homeowners, thriving businesses. Urban renewal was a period uh, for fixing our cities. This is what it turned into. And now this is what it looks like. Here's an example from the Netherlands. They went through a similar thing. Here's a, a beautiful canal uh, back, uh, back about 100 years ago. And this could be, well, actually, it looks like 50 years, 70 years ago. We could be designing this in the future, right? This looks like the kind of city we, we are going to be asked to design in the next coming decades. Here's what they did to accommodate the automobile. They filled in the canal and made it a freeway. That's just common sense. And now, and now, now what have we done? We've brought back the canal. What happened to all that car traffic? Did the, did the automobile congestion get so much worse because they got rid of that, that freeway? No. It didn't. So let's look at that. So what has the critique of this been? This is the history. What has been the critique of this? Um, this is an important critique for you all to be familiar with. Um, this We've been talking about this a lot. Um, but I think the automobile, the car, and the auto system of automobility, and the automobile dependent mindset that then resonates back and reproduces the system, and we get a lot more of these cars. This, this automobility mindset is now alive and thriving in the cities of the global south. But for how much longer? So we were just looking at this. Here's the logic as embedded in the laws that govern what architects do. Here's a store, a one-story store. This is in a zone. Uh, it might be on a streetcar. It was once a streetcar suburb before the streetcar was torn up and burned. Um, might have been on one of those streetcar streets. Um, which were single-use zoning. So zoning is a huge part of this. The, uh, on these types of lots, you're not allowed to build housing. You can only build commercial. And in the residential lots, even in streetcar suburbs, can you build commercial? No, you have to build housing. It's single-use zoning. And how valuable is retail space on the fourth floor? Zero value. So. We don't build the fourth floor. We don't build the third floor. The second floor, I'm not sure I'm gonna walk up there. Let's just build the first floor. We're not sure it's gonna be a viable business. So you get one story of retail everywhere you look in the world, in the United States. You see one story of retail on the most valuable streets, the busiest streets in the entire Boston area. That's because it's illegal to do anything else. And the reason these things are so valuable is in part because it was built before the law said you had to provide parking. And these are valuable because you could you built these before the law changed and said you have to have parking. So the, the terrifying lesson in all this is the more you accommodate the car, the worse it is for business and the more it cripples the economy. So this is not a productive landscape. So um, 
Now let's talk about Amsterdam. Who's been to Amsterdam? Who's going to go to Amsterdam? You should all go to Amsterdam. Greatest, one of the greatest cities in the world. What makes Amsterdam, why would I say Amsterdam's the greatest city in the world? Why? They bike. They what? They use the bike. They bicycle everywhere. And everyone knows that LA has always been dominated by cars. It hasn't been, the streetcar capital. And just like LA, everyone knows Amsterdam is always a bicycle utopia, right? Or wrong. Let's look. <clears throat> In the 60s, Amsterdam looked like the United States. And they started filling in the canals, as we saw in Utrecht. Uh, we started filling in canals in, in the Netherlands uh, to make more parking and more roads. And in 1962, we invited Jokinen from the United States to help us plan the city of Den Haag, um, The Hague. And so he planned the city of The Hague. They didn't implement it, but then we invited him back in 1967 to plan the city of Amsterdam. And he did state-of-the-art US-style transportation and urban planning. And this is what he said uh, we need to do in Amsterdam. And we started to do it. Ah, beautiful Amsterdam, famous as the city of cyclists and consistently voted best place in the world to get run over by a bicycle by tourists. But it wasn't always this way. In the 1960s, Amsterdam was a car city. The city was sprawling outside of its 19th century boundaries and the future was the automobile. Bicycles were an old relic of the 20th century and Americans were ahead of building the cities of the future. So the Dutch looked to America for inspiration. In the 1960s, American planner David Yokman was brought in to modernize the city. It was assumed that in a modern city, just like in America, most people would choose to live in the suburbs and commute into the city center by car. So the result was Plan Yokman, a plan to make Amsterdam easily accessible by car. Plan Yokman had several aspects that were pretty radical by Dutch standards, but fairly commonplace in America. The single canal was going to be filled in to make a six lane highway, forming a ring road around the city center. Access to the ring road would come in from the south and require demolishing the working class neighborhood of the pipe. These highways would lead to an area of high office towers and form a new central business district, which would require demolishing parts of Old Vest. It was expected that all visitors to the city center would come in by car, so car parks and taxi centers were planned on the periphery with monorails connecting the rest of the city. Of course, Monorails were not chosen because they were the cheapest or best solution. They were chosen primarily because they were raised up above the street and didn't get into the house. Details of this plan that would have pretty much destroyed everything we know of today's Amsterdam were distributed to the public in a brochure ironically entitled, Give the City a Chance. Seriously. Drawings of the proposed highway probably look familiar to anybody from North America because they look pretty much like every city in North America. Plan Jokinen may seem crazy today, but it was all part of an ongoing modernization of Amsterdam. This particular plan failed, but other parts of the city were not as fortunate, and several neighborhoods were destroyed to build wide American-style roads as part of a highway plan for Amsterdam. These plans were stopped only because of mass protests by citizens in the 1970s. Since that time, Amsterdam has started a series of repairs to undo some of the damage. The city has significantly reduced the number of car lanes and turned more space over to walking, cycling, and public transit. And bicycle use, which was almost wiped out completely in the 1970s, is now the major form of transportation in the city. But these former highways, now wide boulevard-style roads, are still here today, evidence of a crazy car-centric vision for Amsterdam that thankfully never materialized. It's hard to imagine that places like this one could have been highways instead of lively neighborhoods. Where Look at that. As you probably know, most other parts of the world were not as fortunate with highways having destroyed the fabric of many cities, promoting urban sprawl, consuming city finances, generating intense automobile traffic, and making walking and bicycling dangerous and infeasible as alternatives. 
Amsterdam successfully fought back that. against highways and suburbanization, and now it's one of the most livable cities in the world. I'd live there. The question for the 21st anniversary is what other world cities will follow in its footsteps? Would you live there? So how did they do it? It was a project, another example of project system culture. They, they took the 1939 Futurama demonstration effect and they did this. Architects did this. This is how they turned it around. They said, here's what it looks like when people drive cars. There's no one on the sidewalks and the streets are filled. Let's compare that to how much space the human body takes up. It's mostly air between the humans. It's mostly steel, glass, and rubber. Did I skip one? I guess that's how it is. Okay, so compare that same number of people in a bus. That's what that space looks like. Any questions? Pretty clear, right? It's about as clear as the 1939 Futurama. This is another thing that architects do. You can either work for General Motors and produce the project system culture uh, relationship uh, in favor of automobility, or you can do it with this. So now let's compare this uh, if everyone's on a bicycle. This is what it looks like, and then you move over to the side. So now you're using a tiny fraction of the space you were using before. But wait, there's more. What if you took all the people out of their cars, out of their chairs, now they're standing, and now you put them on the sidewalks, they all fit on one of those sidewalks. So you now have you still have 100% of the space. What just happened there? I think, I think we just saw a, a scenario in which you took uh, 48 people who took up all the space, and now you still have 48 people, and you still have all the space. So now you can actually fill this with cars again. You just, you, all of that, trans, it was, it's free. And here's the weird thing, is when we first got cars, we went from traveling, we, we used to get to work at walking speed. What is that, four miles an hour? And then maybe on the streetcar, you know, maybe 15, 20 miles an hour on average. And then cars came in, and then we got to work at 45, 50 miles an hour. But what happens when you have traffic? Most metropolitan areas, the, the uh, average speed during rush hour is back down to 15, 12, some cities, eight miles an hour. So you're actually, uh, and in some cities like Bangkok, Jakarta, other places, it is so much faster to walk to where you're going than it is to drive that it's hard to justify staying in the car, but you have to stay in the car because the, the environment that you would be walking through is so horrendous. Uh, and you're taking your life in your hands at, at the crosswalks. Like we, we gather, the pedestrians gather at the crosswalk until we have 30 or 40 people. And then we move together because there's safety in numbers and the traffic, constant flow of traffic, will, will, it's like we're ducks. It's like we're geese trying to get across the road. That's the typical thing in a lot of cities of the world. Um, when we built the first freeway in the United States from downtown Los Angeles to Pasadena, the engineers noticed something. This is what, 1938? They noticed something peculiar. And some of you were in referring to this previously. Uh, they opened this freeway and all of a sudden you could get from Pasadena to downtown lickety split. And then after like eight months, it started to slow down. Uh, and traffic jam, the first highway traffic jam formed. And the engineers uh, noted the effect called, they called it at the time in 1938, they called it induced demand. 
The principle is when you expand the capacity, it attracts usage. And so this is how you explain Houston's problem. Every time you widen the highway, it attract people change their decisions about where they go and they flow into that new route and they get clogged up at the exits because there's a higher capacity in these arteries, but then they get clogged up at the exits. And so every, at every exit, there are major traffic jams getting on and off the freeways. And so it redistributes. And so that's also working in reverse. When Utrecht uh, removed the highway and returned the canal, what happened? The traffic flowed to other places. Were there horrendous traffic jams because you reduced the traffic capacity? No, there were not. In 1989, when the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake hit San Francisco, it damaged the Embarcadero Freeway, and they made the bold decision to not repair it. It was too expensive. So they took it down. They created a surface road around the Embarcadero, getting rid of this horrible overhead two levels of freeway. And now the waterfront of San Francisco is so much better, but the traffic got so much. No, traffic also got better. People changed their routing decisions. Google Maps will adjust. Get rid of the freeway, cars will flow in different ways. Sometimes it's worth it. So this is, an, and it seems like every time, every generation of traffic engineers there's always someone publishing this brilliant paper. They say, hey, we expanded the highway, we add another lane, and uh, you won't believe what happened. Right? They behave as if we didn't know what was gonna happen. And guess what some brilliant engineer is gonna publish a paper on in 15 years when they finally finish expanding the highway around Houston? They're gonna discover the same thing, that guess what? That same freeway, even though it's been widened, is jammed with traffic in Houston. So the logical extreme, like what if, what about those flying cars we were supposed to have? Well, this is as close as we got. I'm hoping this is as far as it, that goes, but watch out, right? Have you seen the YouTube videos? I don't even want to think about it. There are flying cars now. Have you seen them? Okay, let's keep it that way. <laughs> so Jane Jacobs, Jane Jacobs was ridiculed for being a busybody housewife who butted her nose into the man's world of urban planning. So to some people, Jane Jacobs, have you heard of her name before, Jane Jacobs? Well, you've heard it now, and I don't want you to ever forget it. Jane Jacobs was not just a busybody housewife. She was a brilliant woman who, when, uh, Robert Moses said, we're going to put a freeway right across lower Manhattan, right through Washington Square Park, because we need to have cross town expressway. We're going to do to Greenwich Village what we did to the Bronx. We have a cross Bronx uh, Parkway. We have a cross Harlem Parkway. We have a cross uh, Lower Harlem, and we're going to do it every. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to do it on Canal Street. We're going to do it at 42nd Street, and we're going to do it at uh, St. Mark's Place. And she said, No, you're not. And she led the protest to stop it. And um, this busybody housewife shut down the machinery of the most powerful kingmaker of New York. And she wrote the most important book for anybody uh, in the urbanism concentration to read from cover to cover. We're gonna read it, parts of it. We're gonna do some sketch writing to give you a taste of it. But this is the most influential book in the study of architecture of cities uh, so far. 
It's called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, second only to Rothstein's The Color of Law. And uh, it's so important that a lot of these architectural analyses that we do and a lot of drawing we do in studio is based on the fundamental principle uh, that Jane Jacobs uh, identified and opened our eyes to called Eyes on the Street. Eyes on the Street, you've heard of that, right? You've heard of Eyes on the Street? Who's heard of Eyes on the Street? What's the idea of Eyes on the Street? Basically, the theory that like the more people are observed, the less likely people are to commit crimes. Yeah, basically that's it. If you have windows and people behind those windows, then uh, the whole atmosphere on the street changes. We've talked about the pepper spray test, right? You, what's the pepper spray test? Someone just explain. Go ahead. Yeah, you're a woman. Imagine you're a woman. Designers have empathy for all users. So you are now all young women. Your parents love you. They care for you. So they make sure that you, when you go off to college, you have pepper spray. Okay. So you're walking down the street and life is great. You turn the corner. Whoa, this feels a little sketchy. I reach into my pocket because I'm not, I'm, I'm not stupid and my parents love me. I reach into my pocket to just check to make sure my pepper spray is there. That street that you just turned down failed the pepper spray test. What is the number one factor in passing or failing the pepper spray test for a, a place? It's this. Yes. Lighting is one. Um, you have to have lots of factors. The main thing is you have to have windows where there's a reasonable expectation that there are people behind those windows. And if you are going to threaten young women in public space in the evening, where, where, where do you do that? You don't do it on streets with lots of people behind the windows and stoops every 50 feet. You choose a place where there's a parking lot, thank you, Wentworth, or a concrete building with no windows at all, thank you, Wentworth, Tansy, Jim, or a place with a chain link fence and shrubbery behind the chain link fence in front of a concrete facade with no windows, thank you, Wentworth, right? Some of the most dangerous environments on God's green earth are the product of the campus design of Wentworth. Stop the madness, these parking lots. And so a lot of towns have rules about what percentage of the facade, you're gonna to have to design buildings that comply with the rules, the Jane Jacobs eyes on the streets rules. Uh, I wrote some of these rules for the city of Cambridge, uh, where it said you can't, you can't go more than 50 feet without an entrance or 100 feet. You can't go 100 feet without having an entrance to the building. A certain percentage of the facade has to be glass. There has to be something happening behind the glass. It can't be a display window that's screening a parking garage. There are rules that produce eyes on the street. And there are economic incentives for bad behavior by architects that create spaces that do not pass the pepper spray test. So um, this produces a type of architectural drawing that we do routinely. We draw street sections that shows both sides of the street, which shows the curve. Uh, not actually, take it back, this doesn't really work. Um, it shows the first layer of program space behind the facade uh, I, I need a better slide, don't I? But that's a type of drawing where we test the architecture to see if it produces safe spaces, eyes on the street. Uh, it produces safe spaces for all of us. One of the biggest factors, this is research from the 70s uh, by uh, Donald Appleyard uh, looking at San Francisco. Some streets have traffic and fewer social connections. 
some streets have lower traffic and tons more social connections. So this is also part related to the eyes on the street pepper spray test idea is that the more traffic you have, the more dangerous the location is for everyone. And there's a race component to it as always. There's the uh, interstate highway system uh, constructed as a system of national defense. We need to be able to mobilize our military in case of uh, war with the Soviet Union. And uh, we cut those freeways through the center of the poorest and blackest neighborhoods. And here we have the North End in Boston. Uh, back in the day, so this is where the freeway gets cut. And this is the East End where the whole place is demolished. The residents of the East End are displaced elsewhere. And uh, anthropologists make it a central uh, location of study. And have you seen this? I'm not sure if this is gonna help the, uh, the analysis thing, but um, this is truly remarkable. Let's look at Boston. Is it gonna load? Well, you can explore this on your own. It's just, uh, I think it's just loading, no, it's not working. Oh, it's closed for renovations. That's too bad. Anyway, it gives you a slider uh, and you are able to, um, to pull the slider across. You see uh, Boston or whatever city you're interested in before the freeway is built through and then after. And I think this one is showing us the big dig. So the, the key slide that we wanna look at here has to do with um, Boston uh, and our neighborhood here. So we've talked about this before. This is just the slide to support the conversations that we've had in the past that uh, the plan was to build a ring road uh, through Cambridge uh, and through this neighborhood uh, and connect all the way down. Uh, this is the Southwest Corridor. <clears throat> and where's Wentworth on? Uh, like less, yeah. So this is Wentworth. This is Annex Complex. So Ruggle Street was planned to be a freeway. The entirety of the Southwest Corridor was also part of this freeway infrastructure plan. This, um, and you see it here, the Southwest Expressway. This plan was uh, fought and stopped. Uh, Sergeant was actually a transportation planner from MIT and he became governor. And uh, does, where's this? Have you seen this? Where is this? Do you recognize anything in this photo? It's hard to see. But this is the orange line. This is Alice Hayward Taylor at Holmes. This is Ruggles. This is Northeastern. That means we are right here. This is the annex complex right here. This is what this neighborhood was planned to look like. Now, here's an interesting thing. This is what the MBTA map used to look like. It used to end here. But the MBTA did a miraculous thing. They extended the green line. And last, uh, the last year or two, uh, Studio 7 Urbanism Concentration has looked at what the implications 
for this expansion is for the neighborhood around Union Square. And the, all of the issues and questions covered in this course were directly brought to bear on their proposals for Union Square. And a few weeks ago, I was lucky to be present when those proposals were presented to the mayor of Somerville um, and to see if we could influence uh, what happens in Union Square. Because this is a very exciting moment uh, for the city of Boston uh, in terms of the relationship between transit and the construction of cities. <clears throat> So so these uh, Americans, the thing that you're going to hear about when we listen to Peter Calcutt is VMT, vehicle miles traveled. VMT, vehicle miles traveled, is an important variable, uh, especially in the context of the fact that if you're going to be a successful professional and participate in every uh, part of the economy and society in the United States, you're probably going to need a car unless you somehow weave through the, the, the rat's nest that is the U.S. system and find a way to live in places where you can never own a car. Good luck with that. It's not easy. I lived in New York. I lived in San Francisco. I lived overseas in multiple different cities, and now I live in Cambridge, and I'm very lucky that it's six miles each way, and I love to ride. It's my favorite time of every day. I'm very fortunate. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna get to the positive things that we're in a position to do. Uh, once again, I'm so depressed about all this stuff. Is there anything happy going on? The whole world is becoming car crazy. That's not happy. People are building ring roads. If you updated this ring road map, uh, Beijing just built its seventh ring road. So the red shape has to, I think it's beyond the side. They have, they're gonna need a bigger poster. <laughs> oh, I'm just getting so depressed. The whole world is going car crazy. Is that Bangkok? We need more lanes, right? Right? It, duh, you don't have enough lanes. This is where 30%, 30% of the people here own cars. What's gonna happen when it's 35%? What percentage of US households have cars? I don't know, but for every thousand people, there's like 850 cars in the US. Okay, don't pack up yet. This is the good part. Yes, they're building highways all over the world. That's a big part of China's expansion. The US is trying to compete with China. So they're gonna build roads. They're gonna finance road construction in Africa faster than China can finance road construction in Africa. Okay, Jane Jacobs William is a very H. important Watt. person. But so manager, is and as the mentor of a project for public spaces because of his seminar work and the study of human behavior in urban settings. For nearly two decades, White has been observing how people use streets and public spaces. Using Although film. City is about the design and management of urban spaces. White's true fascination is with the life and rituals of people out on the streets. For him, the street is a stage. In his article about the social life of the street, White talks about the different aspects that are related to how people move around the city, specifically in New York, which is basically where he lives. Here he talks about street behavior, street conversations, and the like. In the first part of the article, White talks about street conversations. Here he shares an experiment that he did with his research team, which required him to focus time-lapse cameras on several street corners and recorded the activity for two weeks. You can do this on your phone. On maps of the corners, they plotted the location of each conversation and how long it lasted. And to screen out people who were only waiting for the light to change, 
they noted only those conversations lasting a minute or longer. The results of the activity were not at all as expected. Even White didn't expect it, as it showed that people who stopped to talk did not move out of the pedestrian flow. And if they had been out of it, they moved into it. He observed that most of the conversations were smack in the middle of the pedestrian flow. So we need to talk about the Congress for New Urbanism. Who's heard of Congress for New Urbanism? In the late 70s, a, uh, a developer said, you know how wealthy Americans, they go on vacation, they go to Venice, they go to Amsterdam, they go to Paris, they go to Rome, they go to all these places that are either car, car less or car, or car free, right? American, wealthy Americans go to places where there are fewer cars, right? So let's build uh, like a wealthy resort second place for second homes for wealthy Americans that replicates that. And so he hired a group of architects and the group of architects said, okay, let's do this. This is a great, it sounds good. Who's, does that sound like a good idea? They, what they found out, it's illegal. It's, you're not allowed to build places with fewer cars. And even if you could legally, you cannot get the financing. Turns out there are 34 generic prototypical projects that the banking industry will finance. They are single use, they are automobile dependent. That has changed slightly now, um, but they were so upset by what they found out. They did what normal people do is they founded a group called the Congress for New Urbanism. Long story short, it was hijacked by a megalomaniacal personality by the name of Andre Stewani. Um, but it didn't stop a lot of good things from happening. The best thing that came out of the Congress for New Urbanism is the work of Peter Kalfler. If you don't remember anything about this course, I want you to remember what Peter Kalfler says. Well, let me add to the complexity of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, at the same time, we don't have time for this. I'm going to give you this clip in urbanism. But the key thing, I heard this like the second time I was a freshman and it stuck with me. And I, for years, I looked for who said it. Turns out it was Peter Calthor. So 1980 something. You have this book? I have both books. Yeah, you should have, this is not Peter. This is a former instructor here at Wentworth yeah. and a friend of mine from MIT. Um, but uh, you should get this book. But it, uh, the key thing that Peter Calthorpe said is he said, you could have a green piece of architecture, a house that is off the grid, very, very efficient, perfectly efficient house, no carbon, net zero. And you put it you know, somewhere uh, outside of the city and people who live there have two cars. And let's say they get a, a Prius, so they're really efficient cars. If you compare that to a conventional, leaky, old, 50-year-old house in a place where there's transit, where there's walkability, and so much so that you only need one car, the conventional house is greener. So it doesn't mean stop your technological pursuit of green technologies, yes, pursue green technologies, but don't neglect the easiest thing in the world to do to make something greener is to reduce the transportation requirements uh, in terms of the automobile. That is the number one lesson uh, that comes out of Peter Calthorpe. And we have a uh, a gazillion groups and ideas, the, the Complete Streets Program, which is a, a blueprint for how to transform and redesign our city streets. The Walkability Index, now real estate is starting to be priced according to how walkable the neighborhood is. If your neighborhood is walkable, uh, it's worth more. And the key thing is transit-oriented development. Peter Calthorpe did not invent it. He may have coined the term. The Congress for New Urbanism 
at least Duani pretends that he invented all these things. No, if you just look at history, every place in the world throughout all time operated this way, except for the United States for a brief moment after World War II, but now we're back. And the, the radius of walkable distance from transit stations is the whole strategy for how we build. So I'll send you these videos. And the 15 minute city, that's how Paris, Paris is at the cutting edge and they did it all based on the 15 minute city idea. Okay, I'll send you some videos. Thank you everyone.